baseball's oldest rivalries, the Cubs and the Cardinals. Midsummer fun in Chicagoland includes the beach, boats, and plenty of baseball, but it's the visiting Cardinals who are having all the fun this season. Fueled by a deep lineup featuring four All-Stars, the Cardinals have the best record in the National League. Meanwhile, the Cubs are looking to move closer to the 500 mark. After a dismal start, they've won six of their last eight, and tonight look to make it three out of four over the Cards. We've got an all-star pitching matchup. Cardinal ace Adam Wainwright, Cubs lefty Travis Wood, next on Sunday Night Baseball. The Cubs and the Cardinals. Midsummer fun in Chicagoland includes the beach, boats, and plenty of baseball, but it's the visiting Cardinals who are having all the fun this season. Fueled by a deep lineup featuring four All Stars, the Cardinals have the best record in the National League. Meanwhile, the Cubs are looking to move closer to the 500 mark. After a dismal start, they've won six of their last eight, and tonight look to make it three out of four over the Cards. We've got an all star pitching matchup. Cardinal ace Adam Wainwright, Cubs lefty Travis Wood, next on Sunday Night Baseball.
beautiful weekend here in Chicago. The wind blowing in a little bit off Lake Michigan right now, so we'll see how that impacts play. Here at Wrigley Field could be a good night for the pitchers here with the friendly confines as the Cubs try to make it three out of four over the Cardinals as we close up the unofficial first half of the Major League Baseball season. Hi, everybody. Dan Schulman, Oral Hershazer with you here in Chicago. John Kruk will be back with us again next week. The Cardinals, for most of the season, have been as good as any team in baseball and have been the best offensive team in the National League. Not only are they good, they are deep. There are no easy spots in that lineup. None at all. And every team has scouts. Every team develops a scouting report and then gets an approach. But no team probably does it more consistently from at bat to at bat than the St. Louis Cardinals. They know how to hit the two strikes. They know how to let the ball get deep and go to the opposite field. And when they get in good hitters counts, they can powder the ball. And these guys are some of the best hitters with runners in scoring position in all of baseball. And number one on that list, actually, is Alan Craig at 483 on the season and standing by with a buster on Alan, after this game, you get to go to New York and you get to be an all-star. What are you looking forward to the most in that experience? Uh, you know, I think it's kind of a boring answer, but just uh, just being there, being a part of the game, and, uh, you know, hopefully getting in the game and contributing to a win for the National League and, and just getting to know the guys in the clubhouse. You know, there's so many great players that are going to be there, and, you know, maybe I can learn a thing or two from, from the guys that are there. So, you know, I think that's going to be the best part is just, just getting to know the guys a little bit. Now, you and a lot of other hitters in this lineup have had success against Travis Wood, who you face tonight. What's the approach? He's a, he's a great pitcher. You know, he's having a great year, has, has amazing stuff, and he works the ball in and out. He has a really good cutter inside to righties, and, you know, but he also throws that change of a way. I think that uh, just comes down to not missing the pitches that are over the plate to hit. You know, I think that, that, that's it. Alan, thanks. Dan, back to you. All right, Buster, thank you. We heard about Travis Wood. We've actually got two All-Stars as the starting pitchers tonight. Adam Wainwright of the Cardinals is on the mound, looking to become the first 13-game winner in the National League. Yeah, and it's his second trip to the All-Star game. This is a dominant right-hand pitcher, one of the best in the National League. His most dominant pitch is probably his curveball. He uses it to put people away. But the thing that was really developed him into a consistent winner and a dominant pitcher in the National League is his cut fastball. Boy, can he pound the strike zone with the cutter and the two Seamer, and he attacks the strike zone. 14 walks, and he's going for win number 13. And on the other side, I'll tell you what, Travis Wood, an all-star this year, has made tremendous growth. This young man is a lefty, could command the ball inside to righties, but really did not have a pitch to his arm side away to righties, and that has really made him a big-time winner for the Cubs. Don't look at his record. Look at his ERA and his effectiveness. He haven't given him much run support, and boy, can he dominate left-handed hitters. The best in the National League at that, his breaking ball is a wipeout slider, and he can also take a little bit off with the curveball. Let's check out the lineup that Travis Wood will be facing tonight. The Cardinal lineup is brought to you by Taco Bell. Matt Carpenter leading off. Carlos Beltran has always had a lot of success here at Wrigley Field. He's having another very good season. He's an all-star. Alan Craig's an all-star. Yadier Molina is an all-star. Matt Carpenter, their leadoff hitter, is an all-star. They've got four of them, including the leading hitter in the National League, Molina, batting 334 on the season. The Cardinals leading the National League, scoring almost five runs per game. And one of the oldest rivalries, one of the better rivalries in a Major League Baseball, and two teams whose fans travel very, very well. And you will see a fair bit of Cardinal red here at Wrigley, as we have seen throughout this four game series. The Cubs though taking two of the first three. They met for the first time in 1892 and it might surprise you. Today. The Cubs lead the all time series. They're up by 58 on the Cardinals going back 122 years. This is the 122nd season that these two teams have met. Got some shadows, got a little sunlight, got a nice breeze blowing in from right field toward the left field corner. And a couple of all star starting pitchers in Travis Wood and Adam Wainwright hooking up tonight here in Chicago. Matt Carpenter ready to go, and we are underway at Wrigley. Alfonso Marquez, our home plate umpire tonight, calling strike one on Carpenter, perhaps one of the more unlikely all stars in the National League this year, but. Look at the numbers. He certainly deserves to be there. Left center field. And the catch made by Brian Bogusevic for out number one. 
Well, Travis Wood on the mound, 26-year-old left-hander, all-star for the first time. He's really establishing himself as a foundational piece for this Cub rotation. Consistency in the strike zone and really fantastic rhythm as far as being able to repeat his delivery and do it no matter what the situation. Second hitter for the Cardinals is Carlos Beltran. Beltran in the top 10 in the National League in Nevada at 309. Big power numbers again. The eighth time, or the eighth time that he is going to the All Star game. And a base hit through the right side. A nice piece of hitting. He hit away from the defense right there. The Cubs were shifting him to play to pull in the infield. And this ball is a way. He just does a good job staying in his legs, staying well balanced, and just driving that ball to right field. Mike Matheny, his manager, talking to us before the game about the efficiency, not just the fluidity, but the efficiency of Carlos Beltran's swing. Matheny saying he knows exactly what he wants to do. He executes it. He does not deviate from the plan. And after all these years, 36 years of age, still going strong. One on one out for Alan Craig. One of the more versatile players on this team and Craig who's normally the first baseman is in left field tonight. Matt Holliday's got a hamstring injury not yet on the DL but he hasn't played the last few days so Craig moves out to left. Matt Adams takes over at first. And Craig just continues to drive in runs. He's got 73 RBI second in the National League to Paul Goldschmidt. And he's got a base hit through the right side. So back to back right handed batters Beltran a switch hitter but batting right handed Oral taking wood the other way. Now this Cardinal lineup has really good numbers against Travis Wood individually and again the same approach we talked about in the open the Cardinals get a scouting report and but they develop an approach and they execute it and they look like they are looking hard away as right handed hitters and trying to drive the ball to right field. This is the third time this season the Cardinals have faced Wood. He's one and one with a 2.63 ERA in the first two starts against them this year. David Freeze looks at a strike. On well, a little adjustment right there by Travis Wood coming inside on the first pitch after watching those two right-handers go to right field. Jammed him. And a pop up is caught by Rizzo. The infield fly rule is in effect. That's the second out, and the runners get back. One of the great strengths of the Cardinals this year has been the incredible numbers they've put up all season long with the runners in scoring position. The Cardinals, as a team, hitting 334 with the runners in scoring position on the season. To put that into perspective, Molina. Leads the National League in batting and he's hitting 334. It's like the whole team is leading the league and hitting with runners in scoring position, and that's why they're just scoring a crazy number of runs this year. Yeah, and this guy will go up there and battle you, and he's going to have to battle. He's in an 0 for 17 slump right now. Yeah, he's had some trouble with his knee, been off and on playing, and they're trying to determine how much they can play him as that knee kind of heals. The man in scoring position, and it will produce the first run of the ball game as Beltron comes in to score. The Yachty does not take much time, and they look like they are looking dead red and away. That's the approach. Even Freeze, who got jammed, it was a fast ball in, but when it's been hard and away, the Cardinals have been barreling it up. Molina breaks out of that 0 for 17 slump with this swing and picks up an RBI for the Cardinals. That's only the second run all year that Travis Wood has given up in the first inning. So three hits produce a run, an early lead for the Cardinals, and here's Matt Adams. As Oral mentioned, Wood is so tough on left handed batters. Adams has not gotten a chance to play a whole lot against lefties. But he's done well. Six for 16 with two homers against him. 
And this is a guy, if they could, Oral, they'd find more at bats for him. He's a good hitter, but right now he's got to bide his time. Uh, he's got light tower power. He can play defense. He's a genuine big leaguer that could be part of a championship team. But when you're as deep as the Cardinals are, they're struggling to find him play time. Got to play two and one. Next year, conceivably, Matt Adams could be the everyday first baseman for the Cardinals. Alan McCrack could wind up in the outfield. Carlos Beltran's a free agent, so if he's not back, maybe Craig becomes the right fielder. They've also got a young prospect, Oscar Tavares, an outfielder they're very high on. The Cardinals always seem to have talent, and they always seem to have more talent coming. Chopped up the middle, and an easy play for Starlin Castro to end the inning. But a run in the first off Wood, shaking his head as he leaves the mound. Cardinals ace Adam Wainwright will take the mound when we come back. is presented by Taco Bell. Sometimes you gotta live Moss. And in part by Volvo. Spectacular day. Here in Chicago today and the beach was hopping. We drove by it on Lakeshore Ave on our way up north here to Wrigley Field. Still got some sailboats out there. Got the flags blowing in a little bit oral. Different situation here at Wrigley when the flags are blowing in. We'll see. How the hitters can do with that wind blowing in. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the Cubs right now. Brought to you by Taco Bell. They are seventh in the National League in runs per game this year. And a guy who's been as hot as anybody in baseball, Alfonso Soriano. Nine homers in his last 15 games, 16 homers on the season. And how about this one? 388 career home runs for Soriano. The subject of some trade speculation. We'll get into that later. Still got another year at 18 million, though, so that complicates things. This complicates things if you're a Cubs hitter tonight. Well, Adam Wainwright has tremendous stuff, but the growth of him as a pitcher and a team leader, you see that 12 and 5 with a 2 3, but the key is he doesn't walk anybody. Luis Valbuena leads it off for the Cubs, the third baseman hitting 232 on the season. He'll be followed by Starlin Castro and then Anthony Rizzo. Wainwright in the top five in the National League in so many different categories. He's up there in wins. He's up there in innings. He's up there in strikeouts. He's up there in ERA. You name it, he's been doing it. And he's headed to the All Star game for the second time. Although he will not pitch in the All Star game, he was asked by his manager we can move you up a day we can play with an off day and get you an extra start before the all star game but that means you won't be able to pitch in the game he said give me the extra start and that's why he is pitching here tonight and that curveball is a big time weapon. it is a big time weapon and Adam Wainwright's going to have a challenge here in about a minute or two when that sun coming through Wrigley Fields little division between the upper and lower deck on the left field side and it'll start to get into his eyes and it favors a left handed pitcher. 
not a righty because it's going to start to catch him. Just to pitch in a few of these games, Dan, you got to get your hat real low. Hmm. Two two foul to back by Valbuena. You see that glare coming in, and when it reaches the mound and starts to get in the pitcher's eyes as he turns and goes towards home plate, he's going to have that glare right in his face and then have to pick up the target. One of the scarier things is is when it does blind you for just a bit and the ball comes back at you. Got to play again. And Wainwright has assumed the mantle not only of being the ace of the Cardinal staff but also the leader. That was Chris mm -hmm. Carpenter and Wainwright learned from Carpenter. Carpenter still trying to battle back from injuries and the, some cautious optimism from the Cardinals that Carpenter may be may be physically able to join them a little bit later on the season. We'll get into that as time permits. And there's the curveball and a weak bouncer out to second. But in Carpenter's absence Wainwright has stepped in and really become everything you could hope for in a number one pitcher. It's been like a perfect storm for his career even though he had the storm of the Tommy John surgery a couple of years ago but he comes up with the Cardinals after being traded over from the Atlanta Braves outstanding body six foot seven two twenty five learns to pitch has early success out of the bullpen becomes a great starter has a great mentor with Dave Duncan as his pitching coach and a good role model of Chris Carpenter and so he has done an outstanding job developing and using all those things that have been around him to turn him into the pitcher he is today. And he had the big bump in the road and had Tommy John surgery a couple of years ago but great medical staff put him back together. He worked at it and fell back in love with baseball and how to be better and he is better than ever now. An imposing target out of the mound about 6 7 as he faces Starlin and Castro the Cubs shortstop. Castro has been playing well recently both offensively and defensively. He had been playing very poorly both ways and was benched on June the 26th. Since then he has not committed an error and he's hit over 300. Dale Swain talked about you know sometimes maybe you have to hit rock bottom to realize you got to make some changes and maybe getting benched has helped Castro realize hey got to do some things differently. Dale Swain knows as well as anybody Castro's got a lot of talent. He's been an all star. He's had 200 hits but he was really regressing this year from what he had done the last couple of years. But maybe that benching has helped him turn a bit of a corner at least temporarily. A little bit of a wake up call when a young player has early early success sometimes they think that's going to just happen naturally but the league catches up the work ethic that it takes to pull play a full season year in and year out and I think the little benching and wake up call kind of caught his attention to teaching is there but you got to have open ears when you're being taught and developing. Now to back three and two a rare three ball count for Adam Wainwright. We talked about this when we saw him a couple of weeks ago on Sunday Night Baseball and the numbers are still very impressive. He's only walked 14 batters the entire season and two of them are intentional. So only 12 unintentional walks the entire season now in 141 innings pitched. And we're talking this is his 20th start so he hasn't missed time. He has been a workhorse. And he's really worked hard on repeating his mechanics. He's a great hitter, a great athlete, great bunner. Fields his position well. And now he's a strike throwing machine with great stuff. Well struck, deep right center. Extra bases for Castro. Could be three. And it is. Second triple of the season for Starlin Castro. Well, Starlin lets this pitch get deep. It's a 3 2 count. He's making sure it's a strike, but as he gets it deep, he crushes it. It's a two seamer slightly up in the strike zone. And this ball could be a home run on some days here at Wrigley, but that wind blowing in from Lake Michigan, he gets knocked down. But this young man can fly. And a triple is not an oddity when he hits the ball. You can 
see the wind blowing in from right center here at Wrigley tonight. It'll be a whole different ballpark depending on whether or not the wind's blowing in or out. Castro at third, one out. And the batter was Anthony Rizzo, the first baseman, hitting 243 with 13 home runs. You can see three of the infielders for the Cardinals. Now pretty much playing in. The second baseman, Matt Carpenter, is playing back. They feel like when Rizzo pulls the ball, he's going to hit it firmly. Anything off speed, maybe he cues it to the other side, they'll have a shot with the infield in on the left side. And caught on the fly for out number two. Well, infield in, medium depth or back, they're probably going to get that one. They were positioned perfectly. Watch Starlin Castro read this ball. Pro hop, see what's going to get over and get back. That's a freeze on a line drive. You're going on a ground ball, and he did a good job staying at third. So two down with a man at third for the hot hitting Alfonso Soriano. As we mentioned off the top, on a tear, nine homers in his last 15 games. And he'll look at the strike. Sorry's got a big swing, but he continues to produce some of the best eye hand coordination around. There's a lot of movement in this swing, kind of a buggy whip as he whips that bat through. The turbo. You see it there, but he's not going to get cheated. Misses outside, a ball and two strikes. In the back of your head, he swung and missed it, a curveball if you're pitching. You go with a cutter away right there, maybe just to speed up his eyes. I think they come back with a curveball in the dirt right here. Anything inside, I think, will be off the plate to try and set up a next pitch, or if they go to get him out right now, I think it's off speed in the dirt. Swing on the curveball in the dirt. Two balls, two strikes. It's just a little lot, little wide. And when it left Adam Wainwright's hand, it it started to look like a ball too soon. He had Soriano committed, but enough information came early enough because they were going too wide. That ball's right down the middle. I think he swings and misses. So he's gone cutter, curveball, cutter, curveball in the first four pitches. Castro with third, two down. Another deuce. Three and two. I think I'm going to throw him a curveball right here, Dan. I think he's every time we've gone opposite. If he throws the fastball, he's trying to lock him up and fool him. If he throws the curveball, even Soriano knows it coming. He thinks he's going to try and chase it. It is a curveball. Fly ball to center. And the inning is over. The Castro triple is stranded by Wainwright. One to nothing Cardinals at the end of one.
YouTube.com slash MLB slash scores. Find tonight's game, then click on the GameCast link. You'll find up to the at-bat stats on tonight's game, multiple Twitter feeds, and see behind-the-scenes video. Plus, you can join a live chat about the game. Cardinals won, Cubs nothing. Top of the second. Sunday Night Baseball here on ESPN. The Cubs taking two of the first three games in this series. Travis Wood. Heading to the All-Star game, the Cubs' only All-Star representative giving up a run on three hits in the first. And facing Cardinal shortstop Pete Cosma, who comes in hitting 228 and is 0 for his last 27. This is just his fourth start in the Cardinals' last 11 games. Little looper to left field, and on comes Soriano. Boy, when you're over 27, you're just you're just hoping and praying that ball is going to drop in. And he gets to see the first off-speed pitch from Travis Wood. But Travis has really been trying to live with the fastball way to righties, and then sometimes coming in, you see the approach of the Cardinals. Beltran goes to right field. Craig goes to right field. In between this, Freeze is trying to go to right field, but since they came inside, he gets jammed, and then Molina gets the base hit up the middle, but looked like he was trying to go to right field. So it'll be interesting to watch the adjustments by the Cardinals or by Wood. And I think the Cardinals will keep their approach and force Wood to make the first adjustment. The center fielder John Jay. Getting 249 in the season went four for five in last night's game. And now he's five for his last six. As he spanks one the other way for a base hit. Jay is hot, one out single, already the fourth hit for the Cardinals. And that sun's becoming an issue again, Oral. Yeah, you see for Travis, he'll only have the one eye, and he'll be able to pick up the sign and be facing away from that for Adam Wainwright next inning. He's fortunate enough to be in the dugout right now. Maybe he'll miss that glare as it sneaks through the crack there at Wrigley Field between the upper and lower deck. Adam Wainwright gets the bunt down, and it's a good one. 2 4 on the put out as the sacrifice moves Jay to second. Well, he's got the bat angled correctly. He keeps the angle. He tries to catch the ball, keeping the barrel above it. Did a great job changing the height of his bat with his knees and not with his hands. That's one of the biggest mistakes that bad bunners make is that they change the height of the bat by only using the bat and the hands. Just bend your knees and leave the bat on the same angle. The sixth sacrifice of the season for Wainwright. It's a runner in scoring position with two down and back to the top of the Cardinal lineup for Matt Carpenter. Carpenter has done a, a very good job becoming a second baseman. Last year he was a third baseman, first baseman outfielder. And he's also done a tremendous job since being moved up to the leadoff spot of the order. And as mentioned a little bit earlier, the Cardinals have been absolutely sensational with the runners in scoring position this year as we take a look at Do More. Brought to you by Safeco, Alan Craig. The best in baseball. Carlos Beltran, second best. And three other Cardinals in the top ten. No wonder they're scoring five runs per game. As an example, the Cardinals hitting 334 with the runners in scoring position. The Cubs hitting 237. A 97 point difference. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago when we saw them. What is it about the Cardinals above and beyond the fact that they've got some really talented guys right. that allows them to put up those numbers? Consistent approach even in pressure situations letting the ball travel not chasing pitchers out pitches just trying to drive the run themselves. For those who don't know tell us about letting the ball travel well letting the ball get deep so they read the pitch a lot longer than somebody that's anxious and jumping out at the pitch and they don't mind just hitting the ball the opposite field so they take more time to make sure it's a strike and I think the real key is is they're not afraid to pass the baton so when Alfonso Soriano was hitting like in the last inning chasing breaking balls compared to making sure you get a strike mm -hmm. before you then hit the ball. 
And I think they're very good at keeping that approach in pressure situations. When Mike Matheny was asked about it, he says they, they completely discount the notion that the number's unsustainable. He's, he thinks they can keep doing it. The approach is there, so the results should be there. Down and away, three and two, a deep count. And something a lot of Cardinal hitters are not afraid of. Going deep into the count, hitting with a couple of strikes. And again, if you're going to pass the baton, you get a pretty good guy to pass it to on deck and Carlos Beltran. Ball four. He falls behind 0 and 2 and works a walk. So here comes Beltran who had a base hit in the first inning. As we mentioned earlier, he is headed to the All-Star Game for the eighth time in his career. He's among the leaders in the National League in home runs. And as we just showed you, he's got a great numbers with runners in scoring position. He's driven in a hundred or more runs eight times in his career. Rips it foul down the line. Well, that was a professional swing right there and because he decided before this at bat he was going to sit on something inside that was a pull swing that was a completely different approach in the first at bat he saw so many balls away and the other players were getting them and Carlos Beltran said they're not going to go the same place and he sat on that right on the inside part down the left field line and out in front again as he pulls it foul the count is 0 and 2 it is so cat and mouse right now with these guys mentally because again another pitch inside and Beltron is on it and waiting for it. So now if you would based on what the evidence you have from Beltron what are you thinking about here on two. Well since he was out in front of both those pitches that were inside I would go soft low and away and bounce just to slow him down. Bounced a breaking ball, and it's a ball and two strikes. Now Wood decided to go with his curveball, which is not a bad thing because you can make it look like it's going to be down the middle, get him committed out in front, and then bounce it. Just Beltron didn't bite. Bouncer to short. Castro. Just in time, and the inning is over. Two men left on. One to nothing Cardinals through an inning and a half.
Rays. The Chevrolet Home Run Derby comes your way tomorrow night at 8 Eastern right here on ESPN. The MLB All-Star Red Carpet Show presented by Chevrolet Tuesday at 3 Eastern on the MLB Network. And then Fox has the All-Star Game for you beginning at 7.30 Eastern time Tuesday night from City Field in New York. There will be five Cardinals there including the man on the mound right now Adam Wainwright. Although Wainwright will not pitch in the game, he'll be joined by Matt Carpenter, Carlos Beltran, Alan Craig, and Yadier Molina. Travis Wood is mentioned, the only Cub All Star. Deonna Navarro leads off the inning. And the home run derby is tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Always a very popular event. Robinson Cano and David Wright are the captains. And Chris Davis, who, by the way, hit another home run today, he's got 37 home runs for the Orioles, easily the leader. Uh, in the majors, he will be there. Prince Fielder will be there. Yoana Cespedes will be there. Pedro Alvarez will be there. As he took the place of Carlos Gonzalez. I'm picking Chris Davis to win it. Let's take a look at the National League participants Pedro Alvarez, Michael Kadire, Bryce Harper, and the captain of the team from the hometown Mets, David Wright. Good movement on that cutter in under the hands of Navarro, two and two. But you think Chris Davis is the but guy to beat? He is so grooved. Mm -hmm. If he if he's hitting this many in big league games when he doesn't know what's coming, just wait till the BP show shows up and he knows exactly what's coming and they're trying to throw it right in his swing wherever it's grooved that day. I just hope his arms don't get tired. <laughs> Freeze charging. And the stretch at first by Adams. Nice play on both ends for out number one. The American League Home Run Derby participants, the 2013 Chevrolet Home Run Derby tomorrow night. There's Chris Davis with 37, Robinson Cano, the team captain. He's also added Prince Fielder and Yoannis Cespedes. Buster, I know you made your picks on a baseball tonight a little bit earlier today. Who do you like? Well, first, a little bit of intelligence for uh, Anar Diaz, the former catcher with the Indians, is actually going to be throwing to Chris Davis. They've been working like crazy on picking out the sweet spot. I'm going to go with a, the guy with the most experience. That's Prince Fielder, and I think he's going to beat in the finals Pedro Alvarez, who was picked mm -hmm. late to the All-Star team after Carlos Gonzalez was dropped. Guys, I've seen him take a lot of BP down at Florida and Bradenton. He can put on a show. The guy, the reason I like Chris Davis, Buster, is just the fact that there's very little effort to the swing, and I don't think he's going to get tired. So I think that it's such easy, efficient power, and Prince is so violent. So we'll see. But Prince has performed very, very well in the past. And we'll have it for you tomorrow night right here on ESPN. Some guys talk about how the, the first time they're in it, how strange it is, in effect, to be taking batting practice, but without the no cage, cage around you, yep. not to mention 45,000 people and the, sitting there watching. And the you. snoop cams that are so close. Yeah. And a big hopper to first. Adams unassisted. To get to Bogus Civic for out number two, back down to Buster. Hey guys, yeah, I talked to Carlos Beltran today and asked him, I said, okay, you've done the derby in the past. What was weird about it? He said the long lag between your turns. He said, you don't realize how tired you're going to get, how difficult it is to sort of heat up, stay hot. I remember last year uh, while working the sideline during the derby, Jose Batista must have taken 50 rounds of batting practice, it seemed like, during that time. That's why I wonder about Fielder. He just every swing he takes always looks like he's hitting a home run whether it's BP or in games. Yep. And it's almost learning like to be a reliever how to get up and down and wait for the skipper to call you. So when they go down underneath or wherever they're going to take their extra batting practice can they keep the anxiety down and only take just enough swings to get loose and not just hit just to kill time. The strike of the knees and the count is one and one on the Cubs right fielder Dave Sapelt. Sapelt. Recalled for the second time this year, July the second, and he's gone eight for twenty since coming back up. Well, it's a fun event, although mm -hmm. City Field is not the easiest ballpark in which to hit a home run. So I'm not sure we're going to see any records broken. It might be tough to get the ball out consistently. But you know the likes of Fielder and Alvarez and Davis will be trying. Craig can't come up with it in left. Sapel digging for second and in there with a double. That's just the lack of reps and a lack of experience with the wind blowing in here at Wrigley Field for Alan Craig. 
This ball is hit in a way that he thinks it's just going to carry to him. So he runs a route that's kind of lingering. And all of a sudden, when that wind hits it and a little bit of top spin, that ball took a dive. And he realizes too late that he is in, going to be in the wrong place. But that was very easy to catch if he could have got a little better read on what that ball would have done when the wind hit it. And again, Craig playing mostly, almost entirely, first base this year, but can play the corner outfield spots when needed. Here's Darwin Barney. And the Cubs' second baseman hitting just 215 on the season. Looks at a strike. I had a chance to chat with Darwin yesterday, and we, I asked him what he was really working on to get his average back up, and he said he, he really got too mechanical and too trying to stay inside. He's trying to be more athletic and have a little more rhythm in the box now. Shoots it foul into the seats just beyond the first base dugout. 0 2. A tense bat. When you get tense in the box and get mechanical, it, it that bat becomes very inaccurate. You know, and so he's he's trying to loosen it up and see the ball and just kind of free and easy his swing, loosen himself up. You see a lot of movement with his hands as he's going here as he gets into the box, just trying to get the nerves and the tension out. Two. Wainwright's been throwing that cutter a lot. A couple years ago, he went through that Tommy John surgery, and during that rehab, would sit with his wife at home and watch baseball games all the time. Kept a notebook next to him, when, and he really charted what made other people successful. And he tried to add a lot of that into his mindset coming back. And the cutter was a main portion of that. Another thing that he does is he changes his rhythm on the mound, especially from the windup. He'll he'll do the full windup, or he'll do a quick step, or he'll do a, a pause that you kind of see from people from the Far East, Korea and Japan. So he's really tried to incorporate some finesse items into his whole way about going about business. Another cutter down and away. Barney looks like he's picking up the ball quickly out of the hand of Wainwright, the way he's taken the last three pitches. And they've really decided that the cutter is the pitch right here to Darwin Barney. They're probably thinking they can beat him. They don't want to throw him anything soft. That he'll hit himself a ground ball to second base or first base, and they can just keep the ball away and down. Sapelt in the score, and the Cubs have tied it. Well, he did go with something off speed, and he left it up. He they decided to try and fool him with the curveball, and he left it up right down the middle of the plate. Darwin Barney did a good job not trying to do too much with it. It wasn't really down the middle, but it's definitely up. It gives us some time to read that pitch and read the curve. You're working on hitting a curveball in the cage. That's exactly where you try and hit it, right back up the middle. So a double by Sapelt, an RBI single by Barney has tied it. And here's Travis Wood, who's a very good hitting pitcher. He's a rarity, really, a left handed thrower, a right handed batter. He has two home runs this year. He has five in his career, including one off Adam Wainwright. Came back in 2010 when he was with the Reds. Bounce it back into the press box just to our right. 0 2. And here's the home run that Woodwell with Cincinnati hit off Wainwright. That's a good looking swing. He's had some good looking swings back then, even now, too. That's the only home run by a pitcher that Adam Wainwright has given up. Swing and a miss of the curveball to end the inning. But the Cubs tie it. It's 1 1 at the end of 2. We'll hear from Cardinal manager Mike Matheny his thoughts on youth baseball when we come back.
He coached his son's little league team and before the season began he wrote a letter to the players parents outlining his expectations. Matheny explains further in this week's installment of My Position. I'm Mike Matheny and this is my position. I started typing on a flight back home uh, from New York and uh, five pages later um, I'm still going and, and uh, I think people were kind of taken back a little bit as they, they read through it because it was drastically different. I think it was calling all of us out on certain things that maybe we'd been doing thinking we were doing the right thing. I know from talking to the parents, tell me something that you'd like to see developing your child and what are some positive adult influences you'd like to have and where would you like to point them? And it always comes back to character quality and what is sports all about. It should be about fun. Three about relationships and using the format and that platform as a coach to help build those kids in those areas, which they're going to they're going to need those for the remainder of their life. It's a good read. Find it online. It's worth your time. It's not just about the wins and losses. It's about the life lessons, the relationships, the character building. Uh, Mike mm -hmm. Matheny speaking from the heart when he talks about this. Yeah, he is, and you can find that. He has a blog that he does yeah. and takes on different topics, and it really rings home to me. I've done the Little League World Series now for seven years, and to watch all the Little Leaguers there and see the impact that the adults have on them yeah. and the things that Mike writes about are striking right at home about building character and the way we treat our kids when they're on the field and respecting the coaches and the umpires and hustling and all the different things. So in five pages, he covers an awful lot. And remember, getting back to his other job as a major league manager, he's a guy with no managerial experience yeah. before he took this job. And uh, I think you'd have to say, not a heck of a job through the first year and a half. A rookie manager that takes his team, they win the wild card, they go to the National League Championship Series. No, I'd say he's doing very, very well. Yeah. He's a presence when he walks into yes. a room. A quiet presence, yes. a commanding presence mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Here's Alan Craig leading off the third, had a base hit back in the first inning. He'll be followed by David Fries and then Yadier Molina. So Craig last year, Oral, hit 400 with runners in scoring position. This year he's hitting 483 with runners in scoring position. There are those who will tell you, yes, there is such a thing as a clutch hitter. And there are others who will say, no, the numbers say everything averages out for the most part. I don't think it's going to average out with him. This guy <laughs> is a very, very good hitter. And I think there might be a little different theory when there's runners in scoring position. You see that swing right there that he just made. Over the last two years, a 435 average with runners in scoring position, the best over a two year period by anybody in the last 50 years. Look at the other guys on the list Hall of Famer. Three Hall, Hall of, of Famer, Famer and one guy who's going to be a Hall yeah. of Famer. <laughs> Not here, though. Not a scoring position situation, but Craig strikes out against Wood. Travis Wood sets him up with a slow curveball there to slow him down. It looks like they've decided he's an unbelievable fastball hitter because it's all changeups from here on out. Travis Wood's only thrown one other changeup until Alan Craig comes up in that at bat. So unveiling the changeup a little more there. Now David Freeze, who popped up his first time up. Freeze up to the cleanup spot. Matt Holiday is out of the lineup, so that forced a little juggling with Craig and Freeze and some of the others. Holiday with a hamstring injury, hoping to avoid the DL. And when Wood is coming inside on them, the Cardinals have been unable to keep that ball fair. Yeah, if they're taking their body and their approach to right field, the opposite field, when they go to turn on that ball, they're going to have a tough time getting their hands inside it, and they're going to come around it. Just outside. You can see Navarro, the catcher, try to bring that ball in a couple of inches over the outside corner, but did not get the call. Wood just six and six despite an ERA of 269. Now, some people like the quality start stat, some people don't. Quality start is six or more innings, three or fewer earned runs. I'm not sure it's a good evaluation of one start, 
But when right. you can do 17 out of 18, it's something to talk about. It's pretty about. good. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean that he's shutting people out. It doesn't mean he's going eight or nine. He's not. Right. He's going six or seven. It's like somebody making 17 out of 18 pars on a golf course. One par is nothing to write home about. If you make 17 out of 18, <laughs> you're, you're pretty good. He's given them a chance to win ball games, and, and had they played a little bit better defense behind him, had the bullpen done better, his other numbers suggest he shouldn't be a six and six pitcher. He could have nine, ten, eleven wins, but unfortunately for him, he's only got six. A pop up. Barney taking charge, two down. The thing about Travis Wood with the statistics and how sometimes they can be deceiving about effectiveness. The ERA is good. The whip's good. All the different stats and even. He had a game where there were bases loaded two out against San Diego where it took a win to a loss because a pop up dropped between three fielders and all three runners that were on scored and all three became earned runs. Center past to diving Castro and Yadier Molina is two for two. He goes from 0 for 17 to two for two for Yadier. The ball that's slightly up and I think it's a it's going to be a cutter trying to be a cutter on the inside and he leaves it over the middle of the plate. See Navarro set up on the inside there. Get it in there and just doesn't get in there enough. And yet he pulls his hands in enough to get the barrel on the bat and drive it to center field. So two out base hit for Molina, and that will bring Matt Adams to the plate. Adams bouncing into a fielder's choice. His first time up. Three left-handed batters in the lineup for the Cardinals. Carpenters fly out and walked. Adams is 0 for 1, and John Jay's got a base hit. We mentioned the numbers for Wood against lefties are ridiculous mm -hmm. this year. What is it that makes him so tough on left handed batters? Well, he can really command the outer half of the plate with that natural cutter, and then when they start to look for it, he can walk it off the plate and make it a slider. And now that he is able to throw strikes on his arm side, so that's inside to a lefty, away to a righty. He's showing command on both sides of the plate. Nothing particularly deceptive about his delivery, would you say? Nope. He just has been very consistent in hitting his spots. Great athlete, as we saw with his hitting, and he can repeat. You know, when you think about a left-handed starter's numbers against left-handed batters, generally the weaker left-handed batters don't stay in the lineup against the lefties. He's facing the stronger, the better left-handed batters, the guys who play every day. So it makes that number even more impressive. Out of play, full count. Wrigley Field, there have been many years where it seems the ballpark was a bigger draw than the ball club. The Cubs, as everybody knows, they've had some lean years to say the least. But whether it's inside Wrigley or across Waveland or Sheffield on the rooftops, Wrigley Field's always a happening. There's a ball smoked in the right field, a base hit. Molina heading for third. And in there in a slide on a single by Adams. They thought about sneaking something inside. They had lived away with Adam. See him trying to come inside, but they leave it out over the plate. Matt Adams loves to extend his arms, and even though the ball is away, he pulls it. And Yadier Molina, who has dealt with a gimpy knee, you can see going around second there, he's he's lumbering to third. It's real hard to get him out of the lineup. The first and third two down for Pete Cosmo who flied out his first time up now 0 for his last 28. Well, that Molina situation obviously bears watching the rest of the season. The Cardinals are a great ball club. Now you can make a case that not only is Molina the most indispensable player. Cosmo thinking about bunting for a base hit. 
and snapping an 0 for 28 and driving in a run. Very interesting that even Yadier Molina might have known that this was coming because he takes an extra long lead and a very good secondary lead for two outs and a man on third. Look at how far off he is and look at the creep with the secondary lead so that he doesn't become the guy they go for when he goes to bunt for a hit. Outstanding team baseball by the St. Louis Cardinals. So a bunt single drives in a run and makes it two to one. And it brings up John Jay. Those kind of signs are usually flash signs between individual players. That doesn't really automatically come from the bench. Matheny to Okendo, then into Cosma, now down to Molina. No, it's usually just between Cosma and Molina. It's kind of a heads up that, you know, I'm struggling. I'm not hitting very well. The yep. bunt, bunt for a hit's got to be in my arsenal now to get out of my slump. So. Here's the flash sign we're going to use. If I look down at you, just know it's coming. And the Cardinals go back on top here in the top of the third. Three and zero to Jay. A two-out hit from Molina. Good piece of hitting. Adams works the count all the way to three and two and stays on a pitch. They leave out over the plate and then a bunt hit. And they're second in the league in slugging percentage, but they're down. They're like 10th and 11th in home runs. Yes. It's doubles, triples, and just consistent approach. 3 0 curveball. Jay took it for a strike. Base is loaded. That'll bring up Adam Wainwright. But Dan, I understand the 3 0 curveball, but the other thing I really understand is the fact they're going to pass the baton. Yep. This is not a selfish at bat, that that's my RBI, and I don't need to leave that for the next guy. They even leave it for the pitcher. Turn the lineup over. So bases loaded, two outs. Adam Wainwright, a 125 hitter on the season, five for 40. A strike. Well, after the walk, the first thing Adam's going to do is make him throw a strike just in case it leads to back to back walks. Now he's going to be swinging. Pop up back of second. Who wants it? Barney to end the inning. But a bunt single drives in a run, and the Cardinals lead two to one.
81 times a year in this baseball cathedral on Chicago's north side, we Cub fans gather and wait for this moment. We rise to our feet, hold our cups to the sky, and with a one, a two, and a three, we will sing. Harry Carey's presence still felt strong here at Wrigleyville. He began leading Cubs fans and taking me out to the ball game in 1982. The tradition continues, and tonight, former Chicago Bear Gary Fensick will have the honor. You can also watch a full feature narrated by Chicago's own Jim Belushi on tonight's Sports Center following the ball game. Bottom three at Wrigley. Dan Schulman or Hershiser, Buster Olney. Sunday night baseball on ESPN to the Cardinals two, the Cubs one. And Luis Valbuena hooks one fair down the line. And has himself a leadoff double. Right tries to throw a little cutter inside. Well, Bueno does a good job pulling his hands in so he doesn't hook this ball foul. He just able to almost swing and push it off himself. It was so far inside that kept it fair. And now Castro, who tripled his first time up. Get the ball to deep right center field. Trying to at least advance the runner here. Ooh. And will not have the opportunity. Hit on the left arm. Well, Adam Wainwright trying to run a two seamer in there to keep the ball from getting hit to the right side. Boy, it looks like it hits him right on the bone. The subtlety Yadier Molina comes out always when there's a hit by pitch between the hitter who just got hit and his pitcher. He hops out from behind the plate and kind of faces the hitter. Just in case. Just in case. He becomes the first line of defense. The two on nobody out a double and a hit batter but now Anthony Rizzo the first baseman who lined out his first time up. You look at the future for the Cubs and they're in another rebuilding mode we expect them to make some more trades between now and the deadline. But given their youth and their contracts you would expect that Castro and Rizzo well the Cubs are hoping they'll obviously be two of the cornerstones of this team for years to come. Yeah, they've stepped out on these two youngsters. Castro had early pr production and has slacked off, and Rizzo is completely on projection and his power. A lot of upside for both players, both those still with some holes in their game, and trying to become more consistent. Big power potential for Rizzo. And he's been in a slump trying to really get his body into his swing, and they've kind of backed him off to calm the body down again and get back. His whole career, you know, as he came up through the minors, he was a handsy hitter, and he's trying to get back to calming the body down so the eyes see it a little better. And using his hands, trusting his hands. Curveball and a bouncer. There's one and two. Nicely done. Four, six, three, double play. Two down and a runner to third. Nice work on the infield by the Cardinals. It'll bring up Alfonso Soriano when we take a look at his hot zone. Brought to you by T Mobile. Well, under 250 is going to be blue and over 350 is going to be red. You get to see where Sori hits well. And you're going to see it's mostly mistakes in the middle of the plate. That big aggressive swing. He kills the ball when you make the mistake in the middle of the plate. And then the secondary place you don't want to go is to let him extend his arms away, either low or high. He likes to extend his arms. A 
A strike on the outside corner. Albuena down the line at third. Doubled. Advanced on the double play ball. Lays off the fastball, the ball and a strike. You know, we showed the hot zone there with Soriano and the very first pitch Molina and Wainwright attack a place where it was red and hot but the hot zone's a good place to start with your scouting report. The next level is to say what type of pitch out there does he hit well and I bet you it's not a cutter like that from Wainwright that most of those pitches away that Sori hits are a little straighter fastballs or two seamers that are coming back to him. And so. All scouting reports start with okay he's a good fastball hitter he's a good breaking ball hitter he likes the ball up he likes the ball down he gets a hot zone in certain places stay away but then what is that hot zone what types of pitches. Way outside two and two. Pitch count for Wainwright a little bit higher than normal. He averages about 14 pitches per inning. That's one of the, the lowest numbers of pitches per inning of any starter in a baseball, but he's already at 57 right now here working in the third. He just doesn't have his quite his pinpoint control here tonight. We see him throwing these cutters away to Sori, and normally he's just trying to throw them on the corner or two, three inches off, but he's been jerking a few of them out there into the left hand batter's box. Facing a guy like Wainwright and he gets two strikes on you, you know he can put it where he wants to with any of the pitches that he has. This is the curve ball, and you look relative to the T Mobile hot zone. It goes right in that hot zone, but I bet you it's not a breaking ball like Adam Wainwright's that's got that kind of sharp break. Well, Wainwright. When he gets a hit of a two strike count, and that just doesn't mean 0 and 2. 0 2 1 2 2 2 3 2. You add it all up, and hitters are hitting 146 against him this year in two strike counts. That speaks to the, again, the command and the different pitches that he can throw with pinpoint control. What do you think this was about? This was about them. Battling two different scouting reports, and then Adam says, This is what I really want to go with. He and Molina were not on the same page. Cosma came in from short because he wants to know what they're going to go with so he doesn't have to change positions once he sees the sign. And we go to the cutter again, but he missed outside. Last time. The first at bat when they got Sori out, they went hard, soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, and finish him off with a 3 2 curveball. So 2 2 was the cutter. Do they go back to the same sequence? Curveball swung on and missed. Soriano frustrated it as he leaves a man on at third. A big strikeout for Adam Wainwright ending the inning and preserving the one run lead for the Cardinals at the end of three.
Baseball, presented by Taco Bell. Beautiful night here in Chicago. Great city. Alongside here, Lake Michigan, the sun setting, a little bit of a breeze. They've had a lot of rain here, a lot of rain issues affecting baseball games, north side and south side, but no such issues here tonight. We go top four. Cardinals two, Cubs one. Big crowd at Wrigley. And Matt Carpenter lines one to left. On comes Soriano. Out number one. Well, one of the biggest strengths for the Cardinals has been their offense, and one of the biggest reasons why the offense has been good is they've got a lot of different guys who can hurt you. Three of the top five batting averages in the National League belong to St. Louis Cardinals. They've got six players with 35 or more runs driven in. That is the most of any team in the National League. And as we have mentioned on a few occasions already tonight, they all seem to do a great job hitting with runners in scoring position. Five of the top ten in the National League are Cardinals with average with runners in scoring position. Whatever concerns they may have, and every team has concerns, it appears very few of them are about their offense. Obviously, Cosma hasn't hit a whole lot, just snapped an 0 for 28 with a bump base hit. And obviously, if Molina's knee were to worsen, that would be a major concern in a variety of different ways for the Cardinals. But assuming Molina stays healthy, I mean, you got to believe this offense is going to continue to be what it has been through the first half of the season. The change up swung on and missed two and two on Beltron. Molina Oral started 79 of the first 85 games this season as a catcher. That's remarkable. Yeah. He's an Iron Man, but it's getting a little rusty this year in the knee, and they're going to be watching him. It was interesting to hear Mike Matheny talk about he doesn't want to come out of the lineup ever, and when he eliminates him from the lineup, how it's a fight. But the key for Matheny is not asking Molina, but just watching him. On comes Bogusevic to make the catch. Beltron to retire two down. Now the Cardinals tonight have done their damage with two outs. That's a two out RBI single for Molina in the first inning. And then two outs, nobody on in the third. Molina singles, Adams singles. And then the RBI bunt single by Cosmo. That's how the Cardinals have their two runs. Here's Craig, a base hit and a strikeout. St. Louis right now a half game ahead of Pittsburgh. It's not the National League Central. Those teams have been jockeying back and forth at various points this season. Pittsburgh losing today to the Mets. That's a fair ball down the line. Craig with his second hit of the night, and this one is a double. A little off speed pitch that he finds a hole with and has enough swing left to get some barrel on it and drive it down the line. Not the prettiest piece of hitting that you'll see, but good enough that he makes solid contact and sneaks it down there. Twenty second up of the season for Craig, a runner at second, two down for David Freeze, who's popped up twice. Down and away ball one. But Freeze is a guy who hasn't really gotten going. He's been banged up at times this year, but just five homers and 29 RBIs on the season for a guy when healthy. And that's the key for him. When healthy, obviously capable of more than that. And he was jammed in his first at bat, then they went to a lot of off speed stuff. But he has a very good reaction fastball swing on the inner half. Right there, if you're going to come into him, you make sure you get it in. And Matt Holiday are the two guys, and Matt Holiday not in there tonight, nursing a hamstring. 
very good inner half fastball hitters in the Cardinals lineup. And both of them, although they're right handed batters, much better numbers against right handed pitchers this year, Freeze and Holiday, than against lefties. And the Cardinals as a team hitting 285 against righties, but only 237 against lefties. Well, they do have eight hits tonight already off Wood, who's tough to hit. Came in just enough, two and two. And that's the key. When you get a guy that maybe likes the ball in there, he likes to extend his arms. If you get him where he likes it, you can go to the strength, but just make sure it's in a good place because you're going to stimulate that bat. And you put it in a good place, you get him out. But if you make a mistake, it'll it'll be very painful. Now the play right side. And you can just see as this at bat develops the, the ball in the inner half freezes starting the bat. He's not worried about is it in off the plate is it down the middle is it up is it down it's just coming towards the inside and he's reacting to it. They got a chance now if they want to try and freeze him away. No pun intended. <laughs> you think with a. That cutter that Wood likes to throw to the outside corner or a changeup yeah. down and away? I think changeup is a little better pitch if you, can, if you feel it in your hand. Or the cutter away. <laughs> Fair ball! And a run will score! Valbuena decided he couldn't get it out. So he let it go, hoped it would go foul, and Craig comes in to score from second on the play. Well, it takes a kick, but it ends up staying fair. But right about here, he's like, I can't make it. But boy, he didn't realize how close he was to third base. That ball did not have a lot of time to go foul. See where Valbuena is. He's only about eight feet in front of third base. So even if you think it's going to go foul, it's still got to do it in time. It goes as a base hit and an RBI for Freeze, and it's three to one Cardinals as Craig comes in to score again. Two outs, nobody on, and again for the second inning in a row, the Cardinals make something out of it. Although this time they get a little bit of help. Molina already a couple of base hits, a run scored, an RBI, and he's raised his league leading average to 339. Smoke to third. Valbuena's got this one. So how about that? You hit the ball right on the screws, it's an out. You hit a six hopper up the line. It goes as an RBI single, and the Cardinals lead by two.
Football presented by Taco Bell is brought to you by the makers of One A Day Men's, the official multivitamin of MLB, specially formulated for men. Bottom four, Cardinals three, Cubs one, between innings, Buster only in Mike McPhee. Mike, Adam Wainwright's pitch count a little elevated. What are you seeing in him so far? Well, more than what I see out of him, I see these guys taking good at bats against him. They're working deep counts, they're fouling off his good pitches and putting some others in good in play. Now, you get an RBI bunt from Pete Cosma. Is that something that's communicated ahead of time, or is that Molina reading it? Uh, it's uh, something that they know is an option, and uh, especially when the guy's having trouble getting things to fall in for him. It's a great opportunity for Pete. He saw, uh, saw the third baseman playing a little bit back, and it ended up working out great. Mike, thanks. So they've had a bunt single score run, and then they've had a bouncer up the third baseline that Valbuena elected to let roll foul, except it didn't, and that drove in a run. And two heads up base running plays Alan Craig and Yadier Molina just little things that you watch the Cardinals do that are a big part of the equation of winning baseball. They're up three one bottom four Cardinals need a win to split the four game series. The honor Navarro leading it off for the Cubs. The Cubs are forty two and fifty and. I think all things considered if you survey maybe not the average Cub fan but. I'm not sure the expectations were for the Cubs to be within eight games of 500. Not that they're aspiring to be under 500, but it wasn't expected they would be much this year. They started the year 18 and 30. They're 24 and 20 since. Now they've traded Scott Feldman. You can see Matt Garza there on the right. He's with Jeff Samarja. All kinds of talk that Garza is going to be traded perhaps any day now. He's a hot commodity. He's a big time starting pitcher. He's had a lot of success for different teams. He's talked about wanting to stay inside an extension, but it sounds like he'll probably get dealt soon, and he may not be the only one. There may be other guys who get dealt. Yeah, that, that, that man right there is keeping Buster very, very busy. Staying Buster on, likes being busy. Staying on the wire, staying on the phones yeah. with all the GMs and all his connections. There's a lot of talk about Matt Garza and where he might end up, and then maybe he's made his last start for the Chicago Cubs. It's just a question of what are the Cubs demanding in exchange for him? who will pay the price a little bit inside not by much Wainwright going to that cutter again and it's a full count on Navarro Play three and two. Let's go down to Buster. Buster, wh what can you tell us about some players the Cubs may deal? I am told that the chances are 80 20 that Matt Garza is going to be traded sometime during the course of the All Star break. The Cubs have made some progress with a couple of teams. The Texas Rangers are said to be involved. Some National League West teams have been having conversations with the Cubs. And of course, the other guys, Alfonso Soriano, Nate Sheerholz, Kevin Gregg, I think they're going to fall in line behind Garza. Kevin Greg right now the closer for the Cubs. Is it kind of Buster like we see with the free agent market that a certain chip needs to fall before the rest of the market starts to open up. Well I think he actually is the bell of the ball. Garza is the best available starting pitcher right now because no one knows if Cliff Lee is going to be put out there. So there has been a lot of talk about Garza. Other teams are telling me the asking price is really high. But you know there are teams that want to win that have weaknesses in the rotation that may move. Texas certainly fits that description. They've got so many starting pitchers out with injuries right now. Out in front of the breaking ball, it remains three and two. Garza, of course, has had success in baseball's toughest division. He's pitched very well in the American League East. Scott Feldman already went to Baltimore, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that's a big key for the American League East and people that are thinking about a playoff run if somebody has already lived up to pitching under pressure. Wainwright thought he had strike three, but it's a little bit low, and it's a rarity, just the 15th walk issue this year by Adam Wainwright. Usually when a pitch is borderline both down and on the edges, you don't get it, but when it's not only borderline on the height and it's a strike, you get it. Wainwright gave it a little surveyor look from the mound and then continued to get back into his game face. 
Lead off walk to Navarro and that brings up Brian Bogusevic. Now the next piece of the puzzle of course if the Cubs do make these trades and they bring in some talent to replenish the system or to improve the farm system is how much else do they have right now in terms of young players who are down in the minors right now how good are they and how far away are they. Oh and to the count on to Bogusevic let's talk about the farm system Buster. How, how good is the situation there for the Cubs? Well, they are developing a whole lot of position players. When you look at a guy like Javier Baez, a shortstop, Chris Bryant, who they just drafted, Jorge Soler, Albert Almore, number one draft pick last year. The feeling is these guys will be in the big leagues sometime in 2015. People with other teams say they have great position talent. Here's the big question the pitching. And as the Cubs are making deals, they're trying to add as many pitching bodies as they can. It's just got to be so tough if you're a Cubs fan. Been a long time, <laughs> to say the least. And Dale Swain knows it as well as anybody. There, there have been times it seems where just coming out to the ballpark and enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the, you know, a, a, an adult beverage too. That that's enough. But now, you know, you saw Theo Epstein. Expectations came along with him. I would think there will be a bit of a grace period for this regime. Theo Epstein, Jed Hoyer, and so forth. But don't you think the fans are really going to start chomping at the bit for a winner pretty soon? Yeah, I think I think next year they're going to have a little more pressure and the year after is really when they're going to get the pressure and you think about you know if the pitching is so bad and that's what they're looking for why would you be trading Scott Feldman Matt Garza but they're trying to time up the young pitching with the young position players so that it all arrives kind of at the same time. And you know the viewer that saw those prospects and saw A and A plus and double A remember in the minor leagues there's rookie ball A ball high A double A triple A and then the big leagues. So those weren't grades on those prospects they're at what level they have played at the A plus was for high A. Got a piece. Now the Cubs lost 101 games last year. Haven't made the playoffs since 2008. Haven't won the World Series since 1908. Everybody here remembers, all Cub fans remember with a great deal of sadness 2003 when it looked like they were headed to the World Series. So much depends too on on Rizzo and Castro. I mean, those two guys are supposed to be the core. When you start developing the foundational pieces and you commit long-term money to them, if they fail, they're going to put you behind the eight ball as far as the plan. Since opening day of last season. Only seven players remain on the Cubs roster. There's been a lot of turnover. They've already used 42 players this year. As you look at Castro, 23 year old shortstop. And finally, Wainwright puts away Bogusevic after a long battle. Exactly what Mike Messina told Buster in between innings that the Cubs are grinding out at bats and spoiling pitches and they're driving his pitch count up and so the Cardinal bullpen will be tested tonight. Wainwright already at 77 pitches and we're not through four innings of Cub offense. 17 pitches this inning. Walking Navarro striking out of Bogusevic. Now here's Sapelt who doubled his first time up. Hearing what Buster has said and just taking a look at where they are, past, present, future, it feels like a longer rebuilding. I, it doesn't feel like it's next year. It doesn't feel like it's next year. And Bill Swaim has done a great job keeping them close to 500 so far this year. And I know they won't admit it in the Cup dugout or the front office or in the manager's chair, but 500 would be a huge accomplishment for this roster. Especially as they continue to unload, if they do unload three, four, five players, as we see. Theo Epstein, they're working the phones. Right, 
Grab ball to second. Shovel to the bag for one, and that's all that they will get. The SBs are back. Celebrate the year's greatest athletes, teams, and plays. Relive the amazing moments and championships and honor the unbelievable achievements by the athletes as well. By you, the fans. The SBs hosted by John Mann. Wednesday, July 17th, 9th Eastern on the SBs. Also, watching this movie. Showman Oral Hershiser, Buster only Sunday night baseball. John Crook back with us next week. The Cardinals leading the Cubs three to one. The Cubs batting in the bottom of the fourth. Runner at first, two down for Darwin Barney. Barney and RBI single his first time up, accounting for the Cubs' only run of the ball game. A year year ago or so, Darwin Barney was looked upon as a young player that could end up being a core piece for the Cubs, but he's kind of fallen on hard times, and he's not out of favor as much as they just have not stepped up for him, and he really has not produced at a level where they're sure yet. And 276 two years ago, 254 last year, 218 now. National championship team in college and has always had very good tools. A natural shortstop moved over to second base because of Castro, and they really thought they could be the dynamic duo up the middle to really start building this team around. But you're going to have to have more consistent offense. The defense has always been solid. And in the infield, really, some of Castro's immaturity has led Barney to really be the captain. At second base, more the intellectual captain of the team and running and taking the signs from the catcher and determining who's going to cover on a possible steal or hit and run. Darwin's filling a, a key role there at second, as kind of running the infield. But as Castro matures for Swain, they're hoping that he can take on that responsibility as he learns and the more finesse parts of the game. And the 0 2. Ooh. And Wainwright, like his arm angle changed there, Oral, but and that pitch sailed up and away. I'm not sure if Adam got a sign that he thought it might have been a pitch, a pitch out. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they were crossed up. That's a four seam fastball grip. Looks like he's throwing a four seam fastball. Tyner really doesn't stay in his mechanics. Looks like he's coming out of them a little bit to kind of throw a high and away pitch. Fly ball right field. And the inning is over. Mustaroni, Dale Swain on the other side of this break.
Cubs lead the Cubs three to one. In between innings, our Buster only with Cubs manager Dale Swain. Yeah, we just talked to Mike Matheny. He said he's impressed with the at bats that you guys have been having. It's Wainwright. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, we ain't got much to show for it, though. You know, that's one of the kind of guys he is. You know, he, he kind of nibbles and, you know, he gets that cutter going and gets it off the end of the bat, you know, but he's mid missing far side, obviously. But, you know, good at bats. Um, you know, we just got some key guys up and couldn't get it done. Starlin Castro, triple first to bat. You told me before the game, his last 10 games, maybe some of the best that you've seen out of him. What's changed? Well, I think um, you know defensively he's, he's charging the ball much more. He's not letting laying, laying back and at the plate he's getting more, much more aggressive on his backside, getting to, getting his leg lift to his backside, which he wasn't doing earlier. Dale, thanks. Matt Adams leads off the fifth for the Cardinals and looks at a strike from Travis Wood. Adams, a fielder's choice, and a base hit tonight. Cardinals have nine hits through four innings off Wood. Wood came in allowing the opposition just a 191 batting average on the season. Only 79 hits in 117 innings coming in. Now granted there's been that bouncer up the line that stayed fair. There's been a bunt single. But there have been some hard hit balls as well. Wood by the way does have the permission of the Cubs to pitch in the All Star game. On Tuesday night, every other, as far as I'm aware, every other starter, line of the first for out number one. Every other starter who's pitching today, who pitched today, will not pitch in the All Star game. But Dale Swim telling us that Wood throws 45 or 50 pitches on his throw day, which would be Tuesday, and that he's a max effort guy. Goes all out, throws about 95 percent effort on his throw day. So they think it's fine for him to go in there and pitch as much as an inning or 20 pitches in the All Star game. And they're going to hold him back a little bit after the All Star break and get him a little breather. Yeah. Till the next Tuesday yeah, against Arizona. He'll have a yeah. week. Yeah. You know what? First trip to the All Star game as of now and theoretically for the rest of the year, a non contending team. Why not, right? Let him, let him go enjoy and hopefully so. get into the game. And as a left hander, I'm sure he will get in the game. Even if it's for one batter, especially when they need to win the game as the National League to have the home field advantage in the World Series, and you got a guy who left-handers are hitting, you know, a minuscule in the hundreds against. I'm sure Bruce Bochy is going to use him left-on-left -left situation for sure. Word out of New York today, by the way, that Matt Harvey's blister situation is good enough that he will be able to pitch in the All Star game. We can see if he's going to be the starter or not. So many good candidates. There's a ground ball to short. Castro to his left. Two down. All the festivities begin tomorrow night with the 2013 Chevrolet Home Run Derby. Tomorrow night at 8 right here on ESPN. The MLB All-Star Red Carpet Show presented by Chevrolet Tuesday 3 Eastern on the MLB Network. And then the All-Star Game itself Tuesday night at 730 Eastern on Fox. Looking for the right field corner. It would Wrigley Field. 3-1 the Cardinals lead. Two outs nobody on. But this is where the rally started for the Cardinals, both in the third and the fourth. Two outs, nobody on them. They got a run each inning. John Jay's been hot, went four for five last night, and he is singled and walked tonight. And he puts one up on the roof. He's done a real nice job, Dan, through this hot streak of adjusting some things, and especially his hands. He doesn't have as big a hitch. He used to drop his hands almost down to his waist and then bring them back up, and you'll see they're going to stay up around his shoulder. He raises them up and he brings them back to his trigger and keeping his hands above the ball when he goes to swing at it. He used to get caught in between and really have to have serious timing and rhythm with all of his movement and then timing the baseball. But now he's cut down on the movement and really keeping them a little bit more of the conventional height in his stance. Take a look at his hands right.
right here and up and think about them coming down to where his number used to be there the number 19 on the front of the uniform but they're staying up there by his shoulder now. Every hitter's got a different trigger and if your trigger is a little hitch like that or a big hitch like he had it's it's a real hard habit to break when you've had tremendous eye hand coordination tremendous ability your whole life through every level and then you get to the big leagues and a flaw gets exposed because just the ability is so great up here. Sends a fly ball to left field and the Cardinals go in order in the top half of the fifth. Unique ballparks into baseball Wrigley Field opened back in 1914 bleachers and scoreboard added in 1937 which was a big year because toward the end of that season the Ivy was added for the first time the most I think recognizable aspect of this ballpark and then lights added in 1988 only day games until 1988 here at Wrigley Field. Got to keep with the times to a certain extent but at the same time you want to preserve what has made Wrigley Field so unique over the years and that is a battle that is still going on right now in Chicago as Tom Ricketts the Cubs chairman wants to modernize the ballpark in a number of ways and one of the ways oral is to add a big video scoreboard out in left field a big video scoreboard and one of the issues is the rooftop owners the folks who are on top of the buildings across the street. And a percentage of the revenues derived from those seats are paid to the Cubs. But Tom Ricketts says, hey, they need a video board for advertising. They need to get into the 21st century. They need to do what they need to do. The rooftop owners are protesting. So Buster Olney is out there getting a little firsthand knowledge. He is up on a rooftop. Where are you, Buster? Yeah, what an unbelievable view we have here. Now, that agreement between the rooftop owners and the Cubs was in 2004. That's something that Tom Ricketts inherited when his family bought the Cubs. And he's trying to modernize the ballpark. The question is, can a deal be worked out? Now, the rooftop owners have felt like they've been left out of the process. But the Cubs continue to negotiate with the city because they are trying to maximize revenues here the way the Red Sox did in renovating Fenway Park. Dan, back to you. All right, Buster. Thank you. As Wood pops it up. Adams there for out number one and uh, Tom Ricketts obviously as chairman wants to maximize revenues he also 
uh, wants to be sensitive to the fans who are paying to come into the ballpark. It's not just the video board that they're talking about. They're talking about restoring the exterior of the ballpark, a new clubhouse, new wider concourses, a Cubs Plaza, which will include an office building and a hotel here as well. And a giant scoreboard right about where that Toyota sign is, from what we understand. And it has been agreed upon between the team and the city, but that's just hurdle number one that they have to get over in order to actually build that score. And the rooftop owners are not going quietly into the night. There's a ball smoked off the glove of Carpenter into center field. That'll be a base hit for Valbuena. So if there was a big scoreboard right there and you were on the rooftop where Buster is, you might have some trouble seeing center field. Now there's no, we're not taking sizes. We're not close enough to know. There are at least two sides to this story with the Cubs ownership on one side and the rooftop owners on the other side. Well, for reference, how big the scoreboard to go in is proposed to be. It's three times the size of the center field scoreboard wow. that we're looking at, which is the manual scoreboard with yeah. the out of town scores. See how dark it is out there also with our cameras. This is one of the few ballparks that you'll only see shadows casted by the players in one direction because the lights are only yeah. from the home plate yeah. left field and right field side. So the backs of the uniforms are darker. Adam Wainwright see him on the mound. He looks like the back of his uniform is dark. There's no lights out in the outfield. All the lights are focused in the hitting area and then dispersed down the lines. But all the backs of the uniforms here, you'll see they're dark. There's no light coming from the backside. And I'm sure that'll get addressed someday. Did you like pitching here? Oh, I absolutely love pitching here. I love walking down the tunnel and having your spikes crunch the cement and thinking about who has walked those tunnels and then coming out here and it's an asymmetrical ballpark, so it's it's a little hard to get used to when you first start pitching. It doesn't home plate doesn't line up with the dead center of the curve behind home plate either. And so when you look into the catcher and see the umpire and the hitter, you're you're kind of thrown off on, on what direction even to strike. It just puts you out of sorts. It's a lot of fun. The second one on the first. Not in time. Home plate does not line up. You're talking about See? the brick wall, the, the backstop brick. behind no. the plate. Uh -uh, it You're comes, right. It's off. You're right. As we look down there, everything is asymmetrical. Yeah. Here. The center of that curve is about three, four feet to our it's left, to the shifted. third base yeah. side. See, so yeah. you think about being a pitcher standing 60 feet, six inches away from that hitter, or really when you land about 54 feet. It's weird. Uh, it's just, it's an odd feeling. And the other thing that's really odd here is, you know, where they put the lines on the side, the, the really close to the infield grass where the foul lines are. And then the infield dirt is much shallower than much most infield dirt because they, it makes the outfield grass look bigger. They have more outfield grass that way. Rizzo with a high fly ball to right field. Not tonight. Wind blowing in, and Wrigley will hold it. End of five, 3 1 Cardinals.
you believe it? A home run for Queen. Who's writing this script for this kid? Bailey has a no-hitter. Homer Bailey has no-hit the San Francisco Giants. And of course, another no-hitter last night. Tim Lincecum walked four. Got a great catch from Hunter Pence in the eighth inning. Struck out 13 and threw, get this, 148 pitches. As he picks up his first no-hitter, the second of the season. Now Adam Wainwright sends a fly ball deep to left, but on the warning track. Soriano is there. One pitch, one out here in the sixth. So Lincecum, who's been struggling for the better part of two years, no hits the Padres last night. 148 pitches. Two Cy Youngs now a no hitter. I think it was the 240. There is 274th in Major League history. But you know what? He's reinvented himself. It's it's not the electric fastball and the and the split that's awesome. He's got all the same pitches, but he's using different ways to manipulate them. And the Giants went out today and got beat 10 to 1 by San Diego. Other than last night, for the most part, it has been a struggle the last month or so for the Giants, the defending champs, who find themselves eight games under 500, six and a half back of the first place Diamondbacks in the National League West. The Dodgers lost today to Colorado, so they're back to the 500 mark at 47 and 47. Two and a half back of Arizona. Base hit into left field for Carpenter. Pedro Stroke, the newcomer to Chicago, is up in the pen. One of the players the Cubs picked up from Baltimore in the deal for Scott Feldman. And this is one of the very, very few ballparks in baseball still where the bullpens are down the line. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, right, you're right there beside the fans. They can give you an earful, too, if you're on the visiting side. Not so friendly confines down there in the hmm. pen area on the Cardinal side. Yeah, nice close up. You can reach over and grab the bullpen phone if you want. <laughs> You're right there. Not to be advised. <laughs> it is a special place. It is. I mean, as much as there have been so many beautiful new ballparks built, Wrigley and Fenway are still they're still special and always will be. Swing and a miss by Carlos Beltran, one for three. Cubs taking two of the first three in this series. After the All-Star break, by the way, the Cardinals have a very interesting schedule, including their first road trip, which doesn't come right after the break. It comes a week after the break. It's an 11-game road trip, three to Atlanta, five to Pittsburgh, including a doubleheader for Arena, and then three in Cincinnati. Some tough sledding for the Cardinals. They've still got 14 games left with the Pirates. They're a half game ahead of the Pirates right now. And they've still got 10 games left with the Reds. And Mike Matheny said before the game, it's exactly the way you want it to be. Mm -hmm. No real frustration that they played so well and they can't gain any ground or get out in front of people. Really, Mike Matheny says it's the whole mental gymnastics of controlling and concentrating on what you can control. Five on the right field, two down. Let's go down to Buster for more. Hey guys, you're talking about schedules. How about the Atlanta Braves in the second half? They don't play a game outside of the Eastern and Central time zone. They only have 19 games remaining against teams that have records over 500 on the tough side. But the Kansas City Royals, 44 games in 44 days because of rain out makeups. And they had to play four consecutive series in September against the Indians and Tigers. Wow. Hmm. Buster already back. Lightning quick. Wow. Interviews two managers, goes up to the rooftop, back. A, a little Towels sweaty, off. a little sweaty up there. Got to mop that brow. There is no elevator up there, guys. Must <laughs> <laughs> will be part of our coverage at the Chevrolet Home Run Derby tomorrow night from City Field. Eight Eastern, right here on ESPN.
Down low 2 and 0 to Alan Craig who has singled struck out and doubled tonight. He's headed to New York and he'll have some company. With Adam Wainwright, Matt Carpenter, Carlos Beltran, and Yadier Molina joining him. Three and oh. He was kind enough to join us in our open with Buster and during the interviews talked about how excited he was to meet some of the other players and to pick their brains about the game. That, that's the typical Cardinal way. We're going to the All-Star game to get more information on how to play better. Turn him loose here. Yep. And the strike inside corner with the knees three and one. Would about to throw his 100th pitch of the game as Strobe continues to loosen up in the bullpen. Looks like he's ready. You're already up three to one, a three one count. You might guess something in her half right here and try and jerk one down the line. You know it's a hard ballpark to hit one out of tonight. Lays off ball four. And here comes Dale Swain. And he has made the signal to the bullpen. So David Freeze will face Pedro Strope when we come back. Wood leaves having thrown an even 100 pitches trailing three to one here in the sixth. Park. Go to MLB.com slash Sunday to find special ticket offers. MLB.tv celebrating 11 years. Watch every out-of-market regular season game live on your favorite supported mobile and connected devices with MLB.tv premium. Visit MLB.tv for details. Right-hander Pedro Stroke, formerly of the Baltimore Orioles, was acquired in the Scott Feldman deal earlier this month. And since he has come to Chicago, he's got some good numbers. These are his overall numbers. But in six appearances with the Cubs, five and two thirds, two hits, no runs allowed. Well, sometimes you like a player, but he's a good piece in a trade, and you've got to let him go. And you really believe that with a change of scenery, he might blossom. And that was kind of the feeling around Baltimore. But they wanted to get Feldman. It took Strope and Arietta to get him. One pitch, ground ball to short, inning over. Two men left on by the Cardinals. They have stranded 10 already, but still lead 3 to 1.
Welcome back to Sunday Night Baseball presented by Taco Bell. Well, Hershiser, Buster only on Dan Schulman, the bottom six, Wrigley Field. The Cardinals and the Cubs. St. Louis leading three to one out, hitting the Cubs ten to five. Adam Wainwright trying to become the first 13 game winner of the National League this year. He and Jordan Zimmerman of the Nationals, each with 12. It has not been vintage Wainwright, but it has been good enough so far, Wainwright. His command has been a little bit off, some deeper counts. Fly ball to right field, and again on another night oral, that ball is probably in the seats, and Soriano knows it. Well, Adam Wainwright is a workhorse, and the pitch tonight that's really done well for him is his curveball. As we see that index finger up off the ball, he uses the middle finger for all the pressure on that curveball and to get this ball to bite and spin. As you see that break, that grip develops over time. Some people learn it with the one finger and have it in the air, others turn it into a spike grip where they Tuck their index finger, and others then just join the two fingers together to get some leverage on the ball. Deanna Navarro takes a strike. With Adam Wainwright's curveball, you know, the curveball grip, the two fingers go together at first, then sometimes people will spike it or get it off for more leverage, and Adam Wainwright has his off. A lot of guys will then tuck this down so the hitter can't see that finger off the ball and read curveball early. So when Adam has that off, some pitching coaches and hitters will tell you that they can see it a little quicker because that finger is hanging off the ball. Is it always the index finger or can it be the middle finger that's off sometimes? Well, some guys have thrown an index finger curveball, yep. but there's not as much strength in that finger usually. And there you see the finger up off the ball. And a lot of times with that finger like that, hitters that are very good vision can sometimes pick that up and say, okay, it's a curveball. And so when it's up off, it's a most pitching coaches will then ask that pitcher if they like to have it off to kind of have it there so it looks more like it's a grip it's less obvious did you ever throw the curveball like that no I threw mine point? with the two fingers but all the pressure was on this finger this finger was just resting there and the main reason when you get two, two fingers of double pressure there you just can't get the ball spinning out of your hand how long did it take you or how long does it take a pitcher until he becomes comfortable Oh, what grip he wants for the curve. Well, you, you experiment almost every day. Pitchers are, are not creatures of habit when it comes to grips. They're looking for it every day when they play catch and they find one, they fall in love with it and they take it into a game. You know, they you experiment all the time and you're looking for that little extra sharp movement or a little more command or whatever it is. But Sometimes a teammate or, or even an opponent can show you something and yeah. it changes your pitch, right? Tra Travis Wood, who pitched tonight, was very close to Cliff Lee and Travis picked up Cliff Lee's cutter. And that's helped his career an awful lot. Good pitch to pick up. Yeah. Base hit in the right field for Bogusevic. And Navarro up to second. The Cubs with two men on and one out. And activity now in the Cardinal bullpen. Left hander Randy Choate, right hander Seth Manus as this ball was that close to being an out and maybe a double play because Navarro had a had a tough decision to make here. Well once you get that far off you you might as well just keep running because yep. he catches it you might be out if he can keep his balance. Just misses. It. It's pretty much just contact that turns into a hit. Yeah. It wasn't wasn't laced. First and second one out comes down by two. And a curveball for a strike to Dave Sapelt, who has doubled and reached on a fielder's choice. Packed house, nice festive atmosphere as it often is here at Wrigley. Pretty good number of Cardinal fans in the house, with Cup fans definitely the strong majority. A lot of Cardinal fans around our hotel. Traveled well. It's 
place got to be on your baseball bucket list. Oh yeah. If you've never been here. No. And another curveball for a strike. And Sapelt, he definitely thought that one was outside. Okay, zone up there. Let's see what it thinks. And it says that ball's a little outside. Guy with Adam Wainwright's command, only 15 walks on the year, probably earns that strike. And he chases two down. Well, he can't help him to say, you know, why are you chasing? Because you, you've got to protect some extra territory once you have the wide one call. But Adam Wainwright and Yadier Molina use that information to their benefit so they continue to walk him off the plate. You've got to protect. The last one you saw in that area was called a strike. This one's a little lower, a little farther out, but they went there. Finger up, spin the ball, get it to the outer half, keep it down, get a punch out. So two down, two men on, and the number eight hitter, second baseman Darwin Barney, is the bat. High fly ball to left field and deep. And gone! Just into the basket for a three run homer, and the Cubs have the lead. Doesn't know if he's supposed to go for a curtain call or not. <laughs> I don't know if they were telling him to go and he got shy, or if he thought he should go and they held him back. Julio Borbon is coming on as a pinch hitter now. A stunned Adam Wainwright. You talk about baseball being a game of inches, Earl. That ball was inches over the basket, just enough for a home run for Barney. <laughs> 